everyone, it's Justin again. In this lesson, we're going to be discussing the properties of parallelograms. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to state and apply the six key parallelogram properties to solve problems. First, we'll learn the six key parallelogram properties, and then we'll complete two practice problems. Have you noticed that parallelogram contains the word parallel? That's because this particular quadrilateral was named for the fact that both of its pairs of opposite sides are parallel. For this parallelogram here, that means the top side is parallel to the bottom and the left is parallel to the right. In order for both pairs to be parallel, it also means that they have to be congruent. Think about it this way. If I shortened this top side, but left the bottom alone so they were no longer congruent, I can't leave the right side like this because then my lines no longer make a polygon. What would I have to do to the right side to make it connect to the top to create a polygon again? It would have to shift and it would no longer be parallel to the left side. So in order for both pairs of sides to be parallel, they also need to be congruent. These two properties go hand in hand because you can't have one without the other. If the opposite sides are parallel, then they are congruent. The converse is also true. If the opposite sides are congruent, then they are parallel. We also know that parallel lines give us lots of information about angles, so there are some properties of parallelograms that tell us about their interior angles too. To focus on angles, I'm going to get rid of my side congruence marks just to clean up my picture. And I'll also add in labels for my four interior angles so that we can talk about them more easily. If we focus on the parallel lines on the top and bottom and use the right side as a transversal, here's what we see. Do you notice anything about angles one and two? They're consecutive interior angles, so we know that they must be supplementary. This is actually true for every pair of consecutive interior angles in a parallelogram. So, angles one and two, angles two and three, angles three and four, and angles four and one. I'll show you how we can prove they're supplementary for one more pair here. And if you'd like, you can explore the other two on your own. Let's look at angles two and three. That means I'm gonna use my left and right sides as my parallel lines and the top side as my transversal. And there we have it. Angles two and three are consecutive interior angles, so they are supplementary. Now check this out. Angles one and two are consecutive interior angles, and angles two and three are consecutive interior angles. That means that both of these pairs are supplementary and their angles add up to 180 degrees. Can you use this to determine how angles one and three are related? Angles one and three are congruent. We can prove that by using these two equations. I can isolate the measure of angle one by subtracting the measure of angle two from both sides, and I could do the same thing in the equation below to isolate the measure of angle three. Now I can see that both angles one and three are equal to 180 minus the measure of angle two. And by using substitution, I can show that the measure of angle one is equal to the measure of angle three, which means they are congruent. You can follow the same process to prove that angles two and four are congruent too. So we can summarize this as both pairs of opposite interior angles are congruent in a parallelogram. As a reminder, opposite angles would be across from each other. Let's clear out some space in our diagram so that we can talk about our last properties of parallelograms. Ah, that's better. The last set of properties of parallelograms have to do with their diagonals. Like in all quadrilaterals, the diagonals of a parallelogram go between the opposite vertices. What's special about them in parallelograms is that they bisect each other. This means that we wind up with two pairs of congruent segments among the diagonals. Each diagonal also splits the parallelogram into two congruent triangles. We can see here using the side and angle congruences that these two triangles are congruent by side angle side. And 
if we use the other diagonal, so are these two. And now that we have all six of our parallelogram properties, let's take a look at how we can put them into action. Here we have parallelogram ABCD with diagonals that intersect at point E. And we need to solve for X and Y. I have the lengths of A, D, B, C, D, E, and E, B. Take a moment to review the parallelogram properties and compare them to this picture. What relationships are there between these segments? Segments AD and BC are congruent because they are opposite sides of the parallelogram. Segments DE and EB are also congruent because they make up diagonal DB, which is bisected at point E by the other diagonal. Now that we have a setup for each of these congruences, Pause the video here and try to finish up this problem by solving for X and Y. Let's start with segments A, D, and B, C. Since they're congruent, we know that their lengths will be equal to each other. This means I can write 9X plus 26 equals 12X plus 17. From here, it's just a matter of solving my equation. I subtracted 9X from both sides to get 26 equals 3X plus 17. Then I subtracted 17 from both sides to get 9 equals 3x. Finally, I divided both sides by 3 to get 3 equals x, which is one half of my final answer to this problem. You may have solved this equation using a slightly different method, and that is totally okay, as long as you also got 3 for x as your final answer. For segments d, e, and e, b, we can do the same thing. Since they're congruent, their lengths are equal. This means we can write 6y minus 79 equals 92 minus 3y. From here, we just need to solve for y. I added 3y to both sides to get 9y minus 79 equals 92. Then I added 79 to both sides to get 9y equals 171. Finally, I divided both sides by 9 to get y equals 19. This is the other half of our final answer. And we have now successfully solved for both x and y, so we're done. We have one problem left to do, and this one is focused on angle measurements instead of side measurements. Given the parallelogram below, if the measure of angle 1 is 22 plus 10r, the measure of angle 2 is 11r minus 10, and the measure of angle 3 is 2 minus 25k, solve for k r and the measure of angle 3. Whew. So what relationships exist between these three angles in our parallelogram? Are there any pairs that are supplementary or congruent? Pause the video and see what you could come up with. There are a few different relationships that we have here. Angles 1 and 3 are opposite angles, which means that they're congruent. Angles 1 and 2 are consecutive angles, so they're supplementary. Angles 2 and 3 are also consecutive angles, so they're supplementary too. I can only solve an equation if it has one variable in it. Knowing that, which of these angle relationships will be best to start with because it only involves one variable? Using angles 1 and 2 would be the best place to start since their measures both use the variable r. That will give us an equation with a relationship between the measure of angles 1 and 2. Pause the video here to set up the equation between angles 1 and 2 and solve for r. If I substitute both of my expressions for the measure of angles 1 and 2, I get 22 plus 10r plus 11r minus 10 equals 180. I simplified the left side of my equation first by combining my like terms. From here I have a nice two-step equation to solve. I can subtract 12 from both sides, and then I can divide both sides by 21 to get my final answer of r equals 8. Remember, if you solve your equation differently than I do, that is okay, as long as we both have the same final answer. Since there are multiple parts to this problem, I'm going to keep track of all of my final answers up top here. 
next. We still have to solve for k and find the measure of angle 3. So let's take a look back at the three relationships we have. We already used this middle one, so we could cross that off. That leaves us with two more relationships that we can use. Angle 1 is congruent to angle 3, and angles 2 and 3 are supplementary. But remember, we avoided these originally because in each of them, my equation will have two variables. I can't solve a single equation that has two variables in it. Ah, but now I've already figured out that r is 8, so I can get rid of one variable. I can now solve for k in either of these equations. It's really just a matter of your personal preference as to which one you want to use. I'm going to use this one. Now that I've substituted 8 for r, let me simplify as much as possible. This leaves me with 102 equals 2 minus 25k. Now this equation is completely solvable. I could just subtract 2 on both sides and then divide both sides by negative 25. Now I have my answer that negative 4 equals k. We've now solved for both of our variables. Let's check. Are we done with this problem? Not quite yet. We still have to solve for the measure of angle 3. Since I now know that k is negative 4, I can just take my expression for the measure of angle 3 and substitute negative 4 for k. Then, simplify to get that the measure of angle 3 is 102 degrees. I have three parts to my final answer for this problem. r equals 8, k equals negative 4, and the measure of angle 3 is 102 degrees. Now you can use parallelogram properties to solve problems. Be sure to keep these six properties close by when you complete your practice. See you next time! Hey.